Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we will be talking about decentralized identifiers and with the two authors of the spec. They are Drummond Reed and Manus Borny. And um, if we go to the next slide, let me quickly tell you about what our objective is with um, SSI Meetup. Um, so we want to empower global SSI communities and make them open to everyone in the world so that everyone can participate, um, private people, um, and companies or any local initiatives. And all this content is being shared with a CC by SA, SA license. So this basically means that it's an open source license that everyone can reuse. And all the slides that we're sharing here, that you, um, you will be able to reuse them to build up your local communities or for any other purposes you have. The only thing you have to do is credit SSI Meetup. And today, uh, especially credit the two creators of this material, which are Manus Borny and Drummond Reed. And now let me quickly um, add Manu, who's joining us via telephone because it was a little technical hiccup. Manu, can you hear me? Yeah, I can awesome. hear. Awesome, great. I can hear you too. Excellent. Okay, hold on one second. Let me try my headset. Okay. Can you hear me uh, now? I can hear you good, yeah. Manu? Yep, never mind. I guess you couldn't hear me. No, I Sorry, can't hear back you. Back on yeah. the phone. All right, excellent. So we have um, Drummond here with me. Today we will be doing the session with Manu. And, and Drummond, and, and Drummond will be running the whole session. Um, we plan to do all the questions maybe at the end because this will be a longer session. So we hope to cover all the material. And then if we have any questions left at the end, um, Drummond will be able to cover them because Manu might have to leave um, sharp at, 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 at 60 minutes when, when we run over. And Drummond, please take over and you can then run this together with Manu for the rest of the time. All right, Alex, thanks very much. It's great to be back on SSI Meetup. And uh, especially to have my good friend Manu Sporny joining us to talk about our very favorite subject, um, and I, I really mean that. Uh, DIDs, um, we 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 go way back. We deeply bonded on these. So, Manu, let's start right at the beginning. Where did DIDs come from? And I'm going to uh, give the ball to you because uh, you were the one that first uh, coined that actual term. And do you want to tell a story about that? Sure, absolutely, and um, and uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks for uh, having us on SSI Meetup. And as Drummond mentioned, uh, this is a topic that is very near and dear uh, to uh, both our hearts and and a, a growing global community of people that um, really believe uh, in in this technology. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I, I think you know, arguably, um, people. Uh, if they, DIDs have had many incarnations throughout history, right? Um, some argue that, uh, you know, people were working on them as far back as the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, certainly, uh, this idea that uh, you should be able to kind of uh, have an identifier that you own uh, and that you manage um, is is a fairly old topic. So, so this idea that, you know, uh, you know, where did decentralized identifiers come from? Um, uh, you can see it popping, you know, in, into and out of uh, uh, history, especially over the past 30 years um, on many different occasions. Um, so let, let's go ahead and uh, jump to the next slide. Um, Drummond, I don't know if you're in charge of that. Um, yeah. So one, um, one area that uh, decentralized identifiers kind of popped up in was um, while we were launching uh, work around web payments uh, way back in around uh, 2010, 2011, um, it became very clear that um, the thing that was slowing, out, slowing down payments around the world um, wasn't that the computer system couldn't transmit the information fast enough. It's that you couldn't identify the parties at either end of the transaction. It was still a very manual human uh, process. Um, and we looked at, you know, some of the identifiers that were being used to do that. And again, these are fairly manual um, uh, identifiers. I mean, you know, things like social security numbers, um, um, uh, different banks having different information on uh, individuals. Uh, and so we were like, we, we thought, you know, the, the web has this global identifier mechanism. Um, is there some way that we could add some kind of cryptography to that that made it very easy to identify uh, the endpoints of a financial transaction. 
Um, and this is right at the end of uh, the Mozilla Persona project. So Mozilla Persona was this idea that uh, you should own your data online, you should own your identifier uh, online. Um, and it was a bold initiative to try and get um, uh, people to kind of own, own more of their, their data starting with their identifier. Um, but unfortunately, the Mozilla Persona project uh, failed for a number of reasons that we won't go into here. Um, but one of those reasons was that the identifiers that they chose to use, which were email addresses, um, weren't owned by the organizations that were trying to kind of decentralize uh, the web. Um, and so what that, what that demonstrated was that if we were going to have these new types of identifiers, um, the, where people own them and they control them, uh, that we would have to have a more decentralized way of doing it. The first iteration of it uh, that we tried was around uh, the use of a decentralized hash table. Um, uh, but the problem with decentralized hash tables is that they didn't have the long-term persistence uh, that blockchains uh, have, that we, that we kind of see with blockchains. So, you know, over many, 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 many different, you know, m many years, um, uh, this concept uh, you know, turned from, well, maybe we can root identifiers in the domain name system, so maybe we can root them in email addresses, so maybe we can root them in hash tables to what, where we are today, which is uh, perhaps there's a way for blockchains to help. Um, and so quite a while ago, we wrote this specification around decentralized identifiers, um, thinking that they would be like just one type of decentralized identifier, as you can see there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you know, we had this did colon and then just this UUID uh, at the end of it. It's basically just this identifier. Um, and what we didn't realize at that time, uh, and this was, you know, many, many years ago, was that there may be multiple different types of decentralized identifier networks uh, where each decentralized identifier network had different properties for the identifier uh, and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, um, I think what we were what we were trying to do and what we're still trying to do is uh, ensure that uh, people and organizations can own the identifiers that they uh, use, um, because that's really at the, at the root of owning uh, the data that you have, attributes that are assigned to you, data that's assigned to you, so on and so forth. If you control that root identifier, uh, then you have some amount of control uh, over the data that's associated with that identifier. So that's kind of you know where where it where it started from. Um, Drummond, I don't know if you want to uh, provide a, uh, a a different perspective. I know you were involved for or have been involved in the Internet Identity Workshop for many many years and various other uh, identity initiatives. Um, how about how about your perspective? Where did where did kind of this concept of decentralized identifiers come from um, uh, from your perspective? Uh, it's a great question, Manu, because you're right. We were running uh, parallel history. Um, I, of course, been working on um, uh, what we were calling user-centric identity since, uh, well, it's been about two decades now. And, of course, identifiers have always played a key role there. And my work at, at Oasis on open standards, it started actually with what we called XRI, Extensible Resource Identifiers which was uh, coming at the problem from a little bit different angle. It was more around persistence of an identifier. How could you have an identifier that never needed to change like email addresses or phone numbers or mailing addresses need to change? Um, but of course, same thing that really, if it never needs to change, it means you really do need that control over it. So I spent an awful lot more, more of my uh, you know, life energy than I ever expected on identifiers. And uh, by, by about, you know, mid 2015, uh, recognized that the problem really needed to, of, of, of identifiers really needed to be solved on a decentralized basis. And uh, that blockchain technology was the potential solution. And I and others at IAW, we had sessions in early the, the spring uh, uh, IW in uh, uh, 2015, actually, of starting to look into blockchain technology. We put together a uh, an informal group to figure out how could we do decentralized um, identity management with blockchains. And by that fall, uh, we, we got together and really decided we had enough of an idea we should, uh, we should start to uh, 
uh, actually implement something, specify and implement something. And uh, that particular fall uh, IW that year was attended by a gentleman named Neil John from the Department of Homeland uh, Security in the US. Um, who uh, has long worked in, in digital identity for the U.S. federal government and moved to DHS to head up identity and data privacy uh, in the science and technology division there. So he now had a, an R&D budget, and he too agreed that it, it made a lot of sense if you could figure out how to do privacy uh, properly with that. So he turned around and that fall uh, put out this uh, it's called a SIBR, a Small Business Investment Research uh, Grant on, uh, you can you can read the title here, I love it, Applicability of Blockchain Technology, Privacy, Respect, and Identity Management. And he invited uh, my company and several others that attended IW that fall to apply for this. And, and we did, but specifically um, the application we put in was to say, well, if you want to do privacy, respect, and identity management, leverage your blockchain, the way to do it is with this concept, and we pointed at the previous two documents we just had uh, um, uh, presented, and we said it's this idea about DIDs uh, coming from uh, W3C, and uh, there's a specific way you could implement them on blockchains to uh, allow for the discovery and verification of these of, of public keys and of what we call service endpoints through a DID. So we built on that and made this proposal and uh, thankfully it was uh, accepted and in uh, March of 2016 we began work on uh, the DID uh, uh, specification essentially our our uh, grant uh, it's about a six month uh, grant was to create an initial version of the DID spec and that's when I began working very closely with Manu and a number of others we were surprised the interest across the blockchain identity community was was quite strong, and within six months we had a draft spec that we all felt pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good about. <clears throat> so that that was sort of the origin story and got us into the uh, the first generation of the spec. Absolutely, and I, I wanted to underscore, you know, how much of a place um, uh, or how much of a part um, DHS SNT played in the incubation of this technology. So, you know, uh, Drummond uh, and his organization, um, you know, spent an enormous amount of time, uh, you know, uh, writing, uh, you know, iterating the specification and working with um, folks at IAW and W3C and a variety of different places uh, to put, uh, you know, uh, that what, what had kind of been tribal knowledge at that point into a coherent specification um, while DHS S&T funded our organization, uh, Digital Bazaar, to look into what was possible and not possible in, with blockchain technology at its time. You know, what are the things that work well for privacy, respecting identity management, and what did not work well uh, in current blockchain implementations. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, you, you see, the, you see the, the place of kind of government funding for a variety of these things. Um, uh, you know, people kind of take that for granted, but this was a this was a really great example of of how um, that particular program um, resulted in a couple of key investments in these areas that have now resulted into um, a much bigger uh, movement um, uh, by industry. And I want to second that. Uh, um, I you know I look back on it now and the fact that. Uh, He's continued, Anil and his uh, group have continued to fund uh, research into uh, privacy respecting blockchain uh, technology for identity management and, and security. Um, I really, you know, I just, it's occurring to me right now, Manu, uh, we could call Anil the godfather of DIDs. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so let's uh, let's jump in, and uh, people are probably wondering. So, what exactly is one of these DIDs? And Manu, uh, there's a set of slides. We're going to talk more about the, the effort at W3C, but there's a set of slides that you uh, have presented or, or have prepared for the upcoming W3C TPAC meeting, and we've included some of these in this deck. So, I'll let you uh, speak to this slide that we'll bring up that actually talks a slide or two about what is a DID. Sure. Um... So, so a DID, it's, it's really a, a super simple concept, right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of cryptography and mathematics and all that kind of be stuff behind it. But fundamentally, a decentralized identifier is a very simple thing. 
it's a new type of uh, uh, URL on the web. So URL is that little thing that you put up in your location bar. Um, the key thing about a URL is it's a type of identifier that you can look up and there's information at the end of that identifier. So if you type in google.com into your web browser, that identifier goes out to a website and gets you a page, which is the Google landing page. Right? So decentralized identifier is very much like that. It's a type of identifier that you can put into a special piece of software, and what it will get you is a document about that decentralized identifier. Now, DID has two really interesting innovations over traditional links on the web. Right? So, so a link on the web today, like an HTTP link, uh, to like Google.com is globally unique. You can look it up and you can get data back from it. Uh, but it's not highly available. So, so Google.com is pretty highly available. But if you look at, think of your personal website, uh, if it goes down, when people go to that link, you get a, a page not found. You know, can't, can't contact the server. So URLs today, HTTP URLs specifically, they're not highly available. And then the other thing is that you don't necessarily know that the data that you're getting back is the data that was sent. So there are all types of attacks that can happen um, uh, called man-in-the-middle attacks um, without, you know, if, if that, that happen when you don't have cryptographic assurance on the content uh, that you're getting from the, um, from the other end. So it did is basically it's a new type of identifier that you can look up and get content for, but when you get that content, you know that it's always going to be there. Right? It's, it's highly mirrored around the world. When you get the, get the content, it's always going to be there. And the other thing is that you know with mathematical certainty, with cryptographic certainty, that the data that you're getting back um, is, uh, is valid. Uh, so, and, and that's really it in a, in a nutshell, but we'll build on why that's important uh, through the next slides. Yeah, uh, so and there's one, ahead and jump to the next one. One Go more ahead, property sorry. I'll point out that I think is, is important, it's sort of implicit, but um, the IDs are persistent. Um, yep. Once you've once you've uh, uh, registered one <clears throat> uh, with the blockchain or system of your choice, it lasts. It lasts as long as that system lasts, which is uh, not true of things like you know domain names. Uh, they they change over time, phone numbers, things like that. So uh, let's talk now about what does a DID look like. And uh, Manu, I'll bring up again the slide that you uh, are using with the W3C. Sure. Um, so I, I did is really broken up into three parts. Um, and the front part never changes. So it says DID. This is a decentralized identifier colon. Um, the next thing um, is basically the DID method. That's basically the network that this decentralized identifier exists on. So examples of networks include uh, Sovereign, uh, the Bitcoin network, the Ethereum network, uh, the Veris One network, and so on and so forth. So decentralized identifiers have networks that they're associated with, um, and then so that network identifier goes second. And then the third thing is a network-specific identifier, and and it can be you know one two three four five, it can be a UUID, it can be a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so down at the bottom of this slide, this is a did on the Veris One blockchain. So you'll see did colon v1, which stands for Veris one colon nim, which means this is a cryptographic, uh, it's a crypto nim, and then the identifier, that that long string of, of digits. So it's it's effectively non-human readable gobbledygook, right? But that identifier is very important because that identifier by itself um, uh, can effectively tell you mathematically, like someone can say, this is my identifier and I can cryptographically prove it. That identifier contains everything that you need um, uh, to do that uh, in there. Um, the other thing to point out is that, you know, like a, for example, a sovereign did would be did colon SOV colon and then um, a, a, a cryptographic identifier of some kind um, uh, there as well. Uh, Bitcoin would be did colon BTCR colon and then an identifier. But fundamentally, these things are very simple things to kind of look up, look at, and know. If it starts with did colon blah blah blah, you know it's a decentralized identifier. Exactly. And uh, one thing I'll add here, which is I think a very important lesson, and it actually took us a good year in the process to really come to uh, grips with it. These are not human-friendly identifiers at, at, at all. Right. They actually make things like uh, an IP address look pretty human friendly. Um, so so they don't tackle the problem 
of how you know that a did represents a particular person or a particular organization or a particular thing, like you know your car or your TV. Um, that is not in directly in the did problem space. It is a problem, as we put it from a layering standpoint, that's solved on top of this, um, but but is out of scope for dids itself. Uh, it's obviously an important problem, but uh, there there are a bunch of ways of solving it with with this infrastructure that get us beyond the traditional problem of quote naming systems. All right, uh, so let's next tackle the classic question. So if it did, you know, if it's a resolvable, if it points off like a URL to something, what does it point to, Manu? Um, so so a did points to a did document, right? So that's that's the simple answer. Just like a, just like a, a website link points to a, a website page, a did points to a did document. And there are three pretty important things that live in that did document. So we've been talking, we've been saying, you know, cryptography and mathematics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, and, we're, and, we've, been, and we've been saying a, a did, um, you, you can prove that you have control over that did. Well, the way that you do that is using this uh, cryptographic material, right? Um, so a did document contains a number of different things. Um, uh, the first thing is uh, ways in which you can authenticate using that did, meaning I can use that did to digitally sign something so that you know that thing I gave you that's digitally signed by me um, actually came from me, right? So uh, authentication is one mechanism. Um, that a, a did document kind of has in it. The other thing that's in there is um, authentication material, like public key material. So this is this is the crypt cryptographic numbers that allow someone to receive a message uh, from you uh, and know that it was sent uh, uh, from you. Now, people are not going to see any of this information, right? All this cryptography stuff, it's it's hidden behind user interfaces. Um, in fact, you know, we've said many, many times before that if people even know that there's a did behind the scenes, if they even know that there's any cryptography happening, um, we've already lost, right? It has to be super, super trans, uh, it, it has to be um, behind the scenes, under the hood. Um, but fundamentally, you know, the, the software developers writing um, uh, software for DIDs and, and these systems, they need to understand what's in the DID document and what it, what, um, uh, what you can do uh, with them. So, so there are ways to authenticate that's listed in the DID document. There's uh, public key material, cryptographic material that's in the DID document, and there are these, there are these other things called service descri uh, uh, descriptions. Uh, that allow you to discover services uh, for the person. Like, for example, um, what if I wanted to find a, a, out what your web page is? What's your home page? Uh, what if I want to find out how to send a secret message to you uh, that no one else could snoop in on? Um, what if, uh, you know, I wanted to get access to your business profile page, like, let's say, a LinkedIn page? Well, all of those things are listed in, in the services um, field. So fundamentally, uh, you know, what these DIDs allow is they allow a global way of discovering stuff that you want other people to know about you. Um, and so I, I want to break that into two things because privacy is super important here. And Drummond, I know we're we're probably going to go into the privacy aspects here, but um, DIDs are um, very much focused on trying to ensure that you have control over your privacy. You have control over how much uh, information you expose, expose on the um, on the web and the internet. Uh, you have control over when you send information to other people. You have control over what mechanisms people use to uh, get in contact with you. Uh, and all of that information um, is effectively expressed um, in a did document. From any we, thoughts? Yeah. Did I miss anything? No, no, no. That's and and you 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 made the key point that uh, I usually do at this point. We're not going to go too deep in in today's webinar into some of the privacy uh, uh, implications and possibilities with DIDs and verifiable credentials. But I will just say, if you're looking at this and thinking, okay, I'm going to have one DID and it's going to have one key and it's going to have one service, um, from a public perspective, that might be true. For instance, for an individual, you might want one for your blog or but but. You have multiple public personas, many people do, and you have hundreds or thousands of private ones. So when you think DIDs, 
don't think you have just one. Think you have as many as you need to to have the the privacy and to have relationships and context. All of these, as you can see, are you know they're basically automated agents uh, uh, running behind the scenes to 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 manage this for you. So it's really not going to be complex for you as a user. Um, it's it's the cryptography and the automated agents that are going to simplify this for individuals. All right, so let's uh, jump into the next question. So, Manu, I've frequently asked, is blockchain technology really necessary for DIDs? So, so, so why don't you why don't you take this one first, Roman? Okay. Um, <laughs> And I, I'm I'm happy to uh, to answer, and I'm actually going to going to uh, switch to a, a picture from a, a recent uh, uh, white paper that Microsoft has just put out, talking about how they plan to use decentralized identifiers. And I'm going to note here at the bottom uh, what uh, what they actually refer to as hey decentralized systems. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to provide the answer that the key to a DID is what Manu originally said in terms of the idea is it's highly available and there's not a single point of control for the resolution of that did for where it points to that can be taken offline that can be used to uh, basically block your effective use or control of that DID. Now, blockchains is one technology to do that, uh, more dis more broadly known as distributed ledger technology, um, but you could widen out to any form of decentralized system or network. And uh, as this diagram uh, from Microsoft um, uh, intimates, and one of the things we've seen, Manu, is adoption of DIDs. I think we're up to uh, about nine or 10 uh, what we call DID methods registered with the W3C uh, uh, Credentials Community Group and the registry we maintain of many different systems that are actually going to support DIDs. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so so you know, these these technologies include things like um, uh, highly available, synchronized, uh, traditional databases, right? Uh, it's just their tradition; they're they're synchronized over a wide area. Decentralized hash tables, uh, blockchains, uh, even you know systems that people view as like um, centralized systems, like government systems, highly available government systems, can all implement um, a DID method on top of uh, that that set of technologies that they have. So it's it's very um, uh, technology agnostic. Um, now that said, as, as Roman mentioned, I mean the vast majority of ones uh, that are that look like they have momentum today um, are blockchain-based um, DID methods, right? Almost all of them utilize a blockchain at, at some um, in, in some way, shape, or form. And I like to point out, Manu, you know, when the when questions are raised constantly, do you really need a blockchain? I actually think for the purpose of DIDs, which is a very narrow and specialized purchase uh, purpose, it's one of the classic examples where a blockchain really is a good fit, right? Um, yeah. And that's why we're seeing multiple blockchain projects implementing DIDs. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's it's important to point out why, right? I mean, so so um, with with identifiers that are meant to uh, in some cases, last last the lifetime of an organization, which could be 50, 70, 100 plus years, it's very important to understand um, how the ownership of that, uh, you know, the, the keys, uh, when they were created, when they were rotated out, how that, that document, that did document, changed throughout time. Uh, because there are times where you actually do need to go back in time and verify a signature that may be 20 years, 30 years old. And so it's very important to have a record um, so that you can go back and check to see if the signature that was created, you know, 20 years ago um, was valid at the time that it was created. And blockchains just, I mean, from just a very practical standpoint, blockchains provide that functionality, whereas you have to kind of build that functionality into whatever databases that you may be using um, uh, today. Exactly, and and that also underscores why you're seeing global networks that are are being designed and and governed from the ground up, 
to uh, to provide that function on a public basis. And obviously, uh, I, I work closely with Sovereign and Manu closely with Veris One, and both of us can tell you that's the purpose of those networks is to you know provide that as a as a function for you know like the internet itself to last a very long time. Yep. All right, now, Manu, we're going to get into your very favorite topic right now, and uh, we're, I think we're doing okay. We're about halfway through, but we got to be careful not to go too deep on this or we'll never get done. So uh, Manu is, uh, you know, uh, the, I look at it as the force together with his partner, Dave Longley, and others at Digital uh, Bazaar for, for starting the Verifiable Credentials Working Group at W3C and, and, and seeing it to, you know, <clears throat> almost didn't happen were it not for them. So do you want to tackle this, Manu? I got a couple of slides from your deck here about the role DIDs sure. play in verifiable credentials. Sure. I'll try to try to get through it pretty quickly. So fundamentally, uh, a verifiable credential is a, is a way of you asserting um, some kind of attribute about yourself, like your name or your age uh, or your profession. Uh, and verifiable credentials are typically issued by third parties. So you think you can think of your driver's license uh, as a verifiable credential, your social security card as a verifiable credential. It's issued by the government, you hold on to it, you decide who to show it to and who you don't show it to. Now the identifiers that are used on those cards um, are interesting. Like for example, the social security number, right? Um, social security number was not designed for identity purposes and identification purposes, but it ended up being used for that in, you know, due to Equifax breaches and things of that nature, those identifiers were stolen. And the problem with those identifiers is you can't prove uh, that it's yours, right? The only thing that really does it is the card that you wave in front of somebody's face, whereas a decentralized identifier, you can actually prove that it's yours by generating a digital signature using the identifier. So, so where are decentralized identifiers used in verifiable credentials? Well, decentralized identifiers are used to replace um, or augment the existing identifiers on those documents, right? So uh, when we talk about something like a person or an organization um, or a thing like a device, um, we need, we usually give it an identifier, especially in the computing world, we give it an identifier. And we say device 1234 or car 5709. Uh, you know, um, a decentralized identifier allows us to assign a decentralized identifier to that device uh, or person or organization where they can now assert that they're that organization, right? With a social security number, you can't really do that. With a decentralized identifier, you can generate a, de uh, a digital signature to do that. So basically, these blue circles that you see in the middle of the screen, where we would normally put social security numbers or driver's uh, license uh, numbers, driver's IDs, um, we can replace those with decentralized identifiers. And then all of a sudden, it becomes this thing that is very difficult to steal from you, right? So if somebody breaks into the system, they find out what your decentralized identifier is, they still can't prove uh, that they're in control of that decentralized identifier. It's only the people that have access to the cryptographic keys and all that kind of stuff um, can, can actually prove that. So in a nutshell, decentralized identifiers are used in verifiable credentials um, to identify uh, organizations, uh, people, places, uh, things, uh, uh, things of that nature. So, uh, and we've we've covered this pretty much. But do you want to um, um, talk about why this is better than URLs or addresses we've used today? You pretty much were talking about that. But I have another uh, one of the slides from the Verifiable Credentials Working Group. Maybe you want to talk to that. Sure. So, so you know, the the important thing, so the DNS system that exists today has served us very well, right? I mean, it's the, you know, Google.com, Yahoo.com, those names, those domain names need to be translated into uh, an internet uh, address, and that's how you get the web page. That's your, how your computer knows where to go to get the web page and get it back to your system. Um, so, you know, uh, DIDs are complementary to the current DNS system. They're not meant as a complete replacement uh, to the DNS system. But one of the, it's, it's important to kind of talk about um, the known flaws in the current DNS system. And, and one of those is that you never really own an identifier in the DNS system. You rent it, you lease it, right? So if you go to 
um, a domain name registrar and you say, I want, um, you know, drummondreed.com uh, or your company address.com, what you're doing is you're, you're leasing that address uh, on a yearly basis. And if you stop paying for that address, um, that domain name address is taken away from you and sold to someone else, sold to the highest bidder. Um, so that's one of the problems with web identifiers today. Now, if we look at um, the next slide, you know, what happens when we put decentralized identifiers in its place? And this doesn't mean use decentralized identifiers for websites and, and that none of that stuff needs to change. But if we start using decentralized identifiers for people and places, then all of a sudden you can have an identifier that you actually own, right? So you can you can self-issue this identifier, you can store it on a global distributed ledger, and as long as that ledger is around, that identifier is going to remain remain yours, right? As long as you control that that uh, cryptographic key material, and in and in uh, some cases, you don't even have to register it globally. You can register it, you can generate it locally, and you can set up what's called a pairwise relationship with another party where uh, that identifier isn't leaked any further than that. Um, so Drummond, maybe you want to uh, talk a, a bit about kind of uh, why pairwise identifiers are, are interesting with respect to privacy. Sure. Um, so, it, yeah, and that it brings up a, a key point. We show here that decentralized identifiers, you know, uh, typically run blockchains or distributed hash, hash tables, highly available systems that are available to large audiences like the public. However, the very same technology will work if you just share, you generated a decentralized identifier and the, the did document and share it with even just one other party. Um, the two of you are still establishing a cryptographically verifiable relationship if, if each of the documents points to how you can talk to the other one. That's uh, what we call, in, in, in sovereign infrastructure, we call that pairwise pseudonymous relationship. And we actually assume that most relationships uh, in Sovereign will be pairwise pseudonymous. And it's primarily issuers of credentials, digital um, of verifiable credentials, who need to have them publicly verifiable that will need public DIDs. And there, there, there are many reasons you might need a public DID, but there's also, I think, uh, gonna be many usages for these uh, private pairwise pseudonymous DIDs, and they both serve vital roles in in, in the infrastructure. We're seeing that, uh, uh, you know, across many uh, um, uh, you know blockchain identity implementations now. Absolutely. All right, so let's uh, let's move over to sort of the the political process uh, um, uh, behind that, because Manu, you, you've been involved with it. Well, we both have been doing standards for a very long time, but you've been very involved with W3C. So first, let's just cover where is the DID spec right now? Um, after we did the initial work for, um, you know, under the, the, the DHS uh, grant, um, it was then contributed to uh, the credentials community group at the W3C, which you helped start. And I think I have, uh, yeah, a picture here of the spec that was, um, uh, I think, a spring of last year. Is that right? Uh, that yeah, we first... maybe, maybe even before then. Um, but yeah, I mean, fundamentally, so these things are incubated um, in what are called uh, W3C community groups, um, and and these are. Um, they're not official international standards groups. They're effectively a collection of people and businesses that want to see uh, a technology uh, mature. Um, and when things go standards track, they have to have a certain amount of maturity, a certain amount of uh, commercial um, uh, traction. Uh, they have to be, uh, you know, implemented by multiple different uh, organizations, at least in an experimental capacity. And we just weren't there. Uh, you know, a year and a half ago or, or whatever it was. So um, so we had to incubate it. So, you know, as Drummond, uh, you know, authored the, the um, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, version of uh, the specification, uh, you know, we took it around to the Internet Identity Workshop, to the World Wide Web Consortium. We held weekly meetings to refine the specification and really work through the, the you know, deep technical um, bits and pieces to make sure that all these different initiatives that were building decentralized uh, uh, identifiers would be able to interoperate uh, at some point down the road. 
Um, and so that's been incubating for quite a while. Um, you know, and, and this is an open process. Anyone can join the W3C Credentials Community Group. It doesn't cost anything to join. We have weekly calls. Everyone's invited. Uh, we have audio recordings. Uh, we have uh, text transcripts um, of the community groups. Um, uh, you know, agendas are public. The mailing list is public. Uh, there really is, if you're interested in this stuff, there's really... Uh, no barrier to, to joining and helping out. Um, the specification itself is on GitHub. Uh, we do, uh, you know, standard source control, pull request to update the specification. Uh, anyone in the, on the planet can raise an issue if they want to on the specification and ask for changes. Um, so it's, it's just a, a really open and transparent process. Uh, that's had a tremendous amount of, um, you know, uh, public vetting um, on on the technology to date. Man, do you want to quickly uh, uh, explain the difference at W3C between a community group and a working group? Sure. So, so a, a community group um, is a loose collection of people that are interested uh, in the technology. You are required to effectively not contribute or not participate if you're not willing to give all of your intellectual property over uh, in a patent and royalty free way. What that basically means is um, you are not going to try and prevent anyone from implementing this technology uh, once it goes out there. That's important for companies that have things like patents that, that want to participate. And it's also in important for individuals so that they can't later, you know, say that they, they, uh, they hold some kind of patent on the technology. Uh, that they contributed. The other thing, uh, and Drummond's got a, a picture of a lot of the folks from this group. Um, and you know, while that's a fairly you know a good sized group, um, the group is much larger than that. It's 200 plus people at this point. And once you you know pull in the Internet Identity Workshop and the Decentralized uh, Identity uh, uh, Foundation. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, various other kind of satellite groups. I mean, this is a fairly large group of people. But again, they're not operating in any kind of official capacity. So that's a community group. A working group is an official thing. There is an official sign-off patent policy. That's when you see large companies like, um, you know, Microsoft and IBM uh, and um you know, just, uh, you know, big, big tech companies joining into the work. Um, they are very focused initiatives. So a working group is meant to standardize globally a particular technology. You have 24 months to do it. Uh, you have to demonstrate true interoperability, which means at least two different companies with two totally different implementations, two totally different software teams, um, you know, passing the test suite and interoping. Um, uh, this is an example of the Verifiable Claims uh, Working Group Charter, uh, but we have one proposed, uh, you know, that's going to be proposed for decentralized identifiers very soon. So a, a, a working group is a very official, very global uh, thing, um, and you're very careful about, you know, the technology at that stage because once you're done, it becomes a, a global web standard, um, and once that happens for successful technologies, the adoption curve is um, insanely fast. It's, you know, several tens of millions within six months, hundreds of millions within a year. Uh, and if you're not in the billions range, uh, you know, in, in a one to two years after the specs are created, it's viewed as a, as a failure, right? So, um, you know, it's a big deal uh, to, to get a working group and, and finish the work uh, in, in one of those things. Which takes us right into our next question about, so why are we, um, you know, at this inflection point of wanting to move from the, the credentials community group, the DID spec there, into a formal DID working group? And uh, I know you've uh, created several, uh, done a bunch of work uh, to help uh, answer that question. So just tell me how you want me to step through these slides, Manu. Sure. Um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump to the, the next one. Um, so the, one of the first things that you do when you try to when you when you what you what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out if it's the right time for a working group and there are a couple of um, signals that you're looking for. Um, the first signal. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. 
um, is uh, you, you flat out ask, if we created a global standards group to standardize this technology, would you join? Right? And, and would you join is, is, a, is a cash, um, it's a question around funding. You have to pay to join the, the W3C and participate in the working group. Um, so companies have to spend a certain amount of money to effectively put it into a pool so that uh, we can standardize this stuff. You can do the proper, you know, patent coverage. You, you're going to put your engineers uh, on it. Um, so it's a, it's a considerable amount of cash investment from the organizations that, that participate. And as you can see from this kind of pie chart here, of the organizations that said that they're supportive of a W3C, uh, decentralized identifier working group, 60 companies have said that they're really interested in joining um, the group, right? So that's, you need, you need at least over 15 to 20, 25 is healthy, 60 is fantastic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's huge. Uh, and that's, that's, that's only after a week and a half of the poll running, right? So this wasn't, this was only running for a week and a half, and we had 50 people said, absolutely, we joined in a heartbeat. Um, the other thing that you look for is, you know, is this going to grow the membership of the World Wide Web Consortium? Is this going to pull in companies to, to build the next generation Internet and Web um, that haven't participated before? And as you can see, less than half of these organizations are already members, which means that there's this new community that's building the next generation Web and the Internet that we really want to pull into the fold, uh, really want to get their uh, input on how the next generation web uh, and the internet's uh, built. Um, the next question um, that uh, you uh, usually ask is, you know, what are you interested in doing with decentralized identifiers? You said you're, in, you're interested in it, uh, but what do you want to do with it? So this, you know, kind of bar chart shows you what people are most interested in. Uh, and at the top of the list is identity management and verifiable credentials. So 69 of these organizations said that those are the top two things that they want to do with decentralized identifiers. Uh, in number three is strong cryptographic authentication along with cryptographic access control and then service endpoint discovery. And so that's telling you that, you know, these things that we thought this were going to be useful for, um, we actually have companies that are now saying, yes, absolutely, we want to see that stuff done. That's what our company wants to use it for. Um, let's go ahead and jump to the next one. Um, the other thing that you're looking for um, is uh, how far along are people? So there's a sweet spot when you start a international standards group. You want to make sure that the technology isn't vaporware, that people are actually building proof of concepts and pilots and products. But you don't want it so far along that it's too late to standardize meaning the companies have already deployed it out in the market. They're very unwilling to change it. They've already made the financial commitments, and they're just locked into whatever solution that they have. So there's a, there's a sweet spot right in the middle, right after when people start getting implementation experience and they're building, you know, products. Um, so you want after that, but you want before someone actually makes a huge push into the market. And this, uh, this uh, set of bar graphs shows that uh, many organizations have re uh, researched decentralized identifiers and they're planning to do experiments in the next year uh, or they've built, they've actually used these in proof of concept systems and they're going toward pilot systems um, or they're producing products. We have 14 companies that have said we're producing products that use decentralized identifiers. So they're not questioning it, they're already doing it. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that the right international standards are in place so that when they go out in the market, we don't have a bunch of siloed, siloed solutions. We have a bunch of, we, what we want is a good, healthy, interoperable marketplace of uh, decentralized identifiers. So basically that data um, shows us that um, we're in a really great position right now. We've got lots of companies super interested in it. We're, we're timing it right. Um, the use cases that they want to solve are the ones that the technology was designed for. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, we have to do something in the next uh, three to six months or we're going to miss our window. Exactly, which brings us to, uh, and we've only got uh, 
I want to leave time for questions. So just a couple minutes to finish uh, our presentation here. Um, if you want to briefly go over this process, we've got one slide you, you presented about the, the process of creating a new W3C working group. Sure. So so we're at the end stage of the process. So the, the first part is, you know, create experimental technology. The second step is incubate in a community group. The third step is gather implementations, build industry support. So we've done all that. Um, next week is the World Wide Web Consortium's uh, uh, technical plenary, the global standards meeting where people come in from all over the world. This year it's in uh, Lyon, France, um, and we're going to be presenting uh, decentralized identifiers as an official standards uh, uh, group um, uh, uh, work item, meaning we're going to ask for a, a, a working group. Uh, we have a, a strong authentication and identity workshop coming up, and then after that, the working group charter goes up for the so around January um, of 2019. So in just three months, um, we're going to put it up for a vote, and we'll know whether or not we're going to be able to have a, a global standardization group around decentralized identifiers. There you go. Now, uh, a little bit more about TPAC. Uh, this is a, a major event within the W3C community, but folks outside are probably not that aware of it. Do you want to just briefly describe what TPAC's about? Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a meeting of, uh, you know, there are 480 companies that are part of uh, the World Wide Web Consortium. They build the next generation web and internet. Um, they are responsible for, you know, how web browsers work and, you know, all, all aspects of how the web works happens at this meeting. Um, and usually attendance is between, I think, I mean, 800 to 1,200 people. Lots and lots of people show up to uh, W3C TPAC, mostly engineers. And there's a ton of face-to-face -face time and collaboration uh, that happens here. It only happens once a year, um, and it's kind of it's kind of the the, the Super Bowl of um, the the standards uh, web standards world. <laughs> that's a great that's a great analogy. <laughs> Uh, and interesting enough, this year, what else is going on that very same week, uh, which is the reason that I will not be at uh, TPAC, even though I was at the last one. And of course, it being the did working group proposal, I should be at this one, but it's also IIW, Internet Identity Workshop number 27. And since I've never missed a single one, I, I can't start now. So uh, so it'll be uh, Manu in, in France and Drummond in, uh, in Mountain View, California. And, and believe me, a lot of the community is torn and there are a whole bunch of people going, uh, you know, to each of them. Um, interesting enough, Manu, I just heard from Phil Winley, this is likely to be the largest uh, IW ever. Um, yeah, well, you know, but I hope it's also one of the largest TPACs ever. Um, and, and yeah. What it reflects is the level of interest, uh, Alex, in self-sovereign identity. It's uh, it's taken the world by storm. So absolutely, um, and, yeah. I, and I'm and I'm going to miss you, buddy. It's it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough with you halfway around the world and as on the other side. But we're both going to be you know pushing pushing the same stuff forward. Um, yeah. Exactly. And I, I, I think we we'll, we need like a, a side channel to just be comparing notes. But I think they're both going to be spectacular conferences. Now, last question here, and would this take us right into the question area? Uh, if, if anyone wants to get involved in this work, what do they do, Manu? Um, really uh, look up um, the W3C Credentials Community Group. Um, and it's got instructions on how you join us. You can dial in any any uh, week that we have a meeting. Um, if the Internet Identity Workshop is in your backyard, uh, or it's easy, uh, you know, for you to get to it, you know, show up, uh, and we'd be happy to uh, say hi and have a conversation with you. Um, you know, this is all uh, open stuff. You don't have to spend any money uh, to participate. Um, you know, all of these communities are very welcoming uh, of uh, new folks, especially if uh, you can write and and uh, you you're eager to help out. Um, I think that's one of the things that um, you know we we didn't mention, Drummond, is that you know we need um, your help. We need we need everyone that's listening to this um, uh, to this webinar's help 
to uh, build out self-sovereign identity and decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. I mean, we're, we're uh, a horribly overworked uh, bunch of people um, in every little bit of help that we can uh, uh, get um, is, is super uh, appreciated. Absolutely, completely. I reinforce that, absolutely. Um, final slide here, just uh, going to questions and you've got, uh, if you wanna see a copy of uh, the public uh, DID proposal, um, it's right there on the screen. And so Alex, over to you. Uh, I uh, don't have visibility directly into any questions. So are there any you want us to tackle? Yeah, the, the, the two questions right now that came up during the presentation, um, I, I shared them with you via Slack. Maybe you can read them out, um, Drummond, if you check it out for a moment. Uh, I can't. I'm going to have to uh, go out of present mode to grab them in Slack. Give me just a second here. All right. Okay, we'll just leave that up on that screen. Let me pop over to uh, uh, Slack here. And okay, are they, uh, ah, okay. So how are DIDs different from uh, d distinguished names in the X500 world? And why does the X500 global directory vision not work whereas the blockchain network, uh, uh, whereas the blockchain network for similar purposes works? So basically it's comparing DIDs and distinguished names in X500. Uh, do you wanna start on that one, uh, Manu? Um, so let's see. That's a tough one. So, so you know, the, the X five hundred. Um, let me let me start with like the X five hundred nine stuff, right? So uh, public private uh, certificates, um, uh, that kind of stuff. So there have been a number of people that said, look, we we already have a, a, a PKI system in the world, uh, and it's broadly deployed. Uh, and that's, you know, the thing that we depend on every single day for, for commerce. It's the, you know, HTTPS, it's PLS, it's the, it's the, pa it's the green padlock icon um, in uh, your browser. Um, so it is possible, it is possible to reuse some of that technology to kind of sort of get um, the, the type of system that, that we have with DIDs. Now, the problem um, is in how you distribute that information, right? How do you get a certificate from point A to point B? How do you, uh, you know, do key rotation? How do you do service endpoint discovery? Um, and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, the X500 and the X509 stuff, it just doesn't support um, and was never designed to support, right? So we, we work, with Drummond and I work with um, the co-editor of the TLS specification. Um, and Christopher Allen, and he mentions uh, on multiple occasions that, you know, the, the CA system was never really intended to become what it has become, right? It was kind of this, um, you know, system uh, that, was, uh, that was kind of patched, uh, you know, over time to give us the system that we have today. Um, and there are better ways um, today of distributing that information uh, to people. Um, for example, you know, blockchains being uh, a, a one of the good, one of the few good uses, um, uh, uh, or sorry, decentralized identifiers being one of the few good uses of uh, blockchain uh, technologies. So you can, you know, you can always reach back in time and say, well, you could potentially uh, achieve what you're doing with decentralized identifiers using like ASN.1 or, um, you know, S expressions or X500 directory services or, you know, X509, um, uh, you know, PKI. But there have been many, many people, ourselves included, that have tried to do that and have hit uh, many roadblocks along the way, right? It, it would solve 80% of the problem, but the other 20% resulted in uh, attacks to the system. Uh, the other 20% would not provide the same types of privacy guarantees. The other, you know, the 20% gap would not um, enable uh, uh, fast revocation uh, of, uh, you know, information. It would not allow arbitrary uh, issuance of things like verifiable credentials. Um, there's just a very long list of reasons X500 and 509 um, uh, doesn't quite 
uh, meet uh, the needs. Now that said, um, you can't do a complete rip and replace of the system. So that's why, you know, during this uh, webinar, you didn't hear Drummond or I saying, we can replace websites with this, we can replace DNS with this, because frankly, that's not a realistic um, that's not a realistic outcome, right? I mean, DNS is, is good for the things it was designed for. It's, it's holding up fairly well. Um, TLS certificates are, uh, you know, holding up fairly well. But if we want to meet many of these other uh, use cases around uh, privacy uh, and ownership of, uh, you know, your decentralized identifier um, and, uh, uh, you know, fast, uh, you know, updates, things of that nature, um, we need fundamentally uh, new technology uh, to do that. Drummond, yeah. I don't know if you have a, a different perspective on that, or no, I, it's it's similar. I um, I, I want to reinforce it, what you just said that uh, DIDs are not intended to replace any other form of identifier directly. They are a new type of it. Just just like phone numbers didn't replace mailing addresses, right? And URLs didn't replace phone numbers. DIDs are a new type of identifier for a new type of world. And, and fundamentally, the biggest difference, X500 is a hierarchical system designed for directories. Directories are inherently hierarchical systems. They are, um, you know, each directory represents the, a, a particular domain uh, and its uh, constituents. And what is never designed to be a global directory system it was designed for organizations. That's why they call it um, you know, organizational uh, names, right? Um, the uh, when we're talking about every person in the world and having not just one but as many DIDs as they need, you need an inherently more scalable, flatter, and more scalable system. And you also need the the control to be maximally pushed to the edge. And that's the key difference with X500. So uh, quickly, so in, in the interest of time, let's get to the second question too. Um, so there, um, another question we do get quite a bit. Can you please differentiate the DID protocol with IPFS, the uh, uh, interplanetary protocol file system, um, uh, which Protocol Labs has uh, been developing for some time? And uh, the, 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 the questioner uh, points out, IPFS tends to be known as more of a decentralized storage mechanism, but there seems to be some fundamental overlap, at least at a high level. And uh, I'm gonna start out by answering that and say, in fact, there is a, um, uh, it's IPNS, the, uh, the interplanetary naming system that layers over IPFS. There has been a preliminary DID method created for that. Um, I don't know, Manu, you might know offhand if that's actually in the uh, uh, credentials uh, group registry. Is there a the ITNS? It is. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, that's, you know, Jonathan Holtz works um, in protocol labs. So, so you know, uh, Drummond and myself, um, you know, have worked with uh, Juan Bennett of protocol labs and um, uh, a number of other folks. Uh, on figuring out how to uh, align, you know, what IPFS is working on and what the decentralized identifier stuff uh, is working on. And, and again, I mean, these are complementary systems. As the as the person that asked the question uh, said, you know, IPFS is mainly meant for decentralized uh, storage and content addressed uh, storage, um, where you could actually make one of the things that IPFS stores uh, a decentralized identifier document. And that's exactly what the IPID project is about. It, uh, as Drummond mentioned, IPID layers on top of IPNS, and that, um, you know, uh, there are layers on top of IPFS. Um, and so there's a really interesting DID method um, that's built on top of uh, IPFS. Um, and, and other people are building it on top of other systems, right? I mean, the sovereign's design um, is is interesting in the way that you know they had stewards and and stewards kind of onboard um, you know identifiers and protect networks from operating. Veris One has its own uh, way of doing decentralized identifiers and uh, syncing them globally and ensuring the network uh, you know is um, uh, is is resistant to attack. Uh, you know the Bitcoin method and the Ethereum based methods have yet different different approaches. So the, the wonderful thing about all these different approaches um, is, that, is that they, through the DID specification, can be compatible with one another. So that an application that depends on DIDs 
um, can hopefully um, uh, program uh, against this in one mechanism, in one way, um, and support many different types of uh, DID methods um, uh, under the hood. Yeah, that's a really key aspect of the design. Some people say, well, th then is it like DNS and it's just like a domain name, it's just different registries. And there's some analogy there, but the different underlying systems have different capabilities. That's why we call them did methods, not just did namespaces. So that is an important point. And uh, I would point you, uh, there's an earlier webinar we did on uh, uh, DIDs with SSI Meetup, which has more technical detail. Plus, uh, both Mando and I would be happy to refer you to the spec um, because it does have a lot of detail. And also invite you to, uh, again, participate uh, in the Credentials Community Group, which does not require W3C membership, by the way. Anyone can come and participate in that. Um, and if you're a company listening to this and going, I really want to get behind this, then please do uh, get in touch and show your support and uh, for the formation of the DID Working Group at W3C. Uh, Alex, any other questions uh, we should tackle? I know we've we've gone right to our hour limit. Yeah, maybe just two more questions that, that came up and um, like a quick intro about why the W3C has been chosen as the standard body to, to, to do all this work or which other bodies could have been chosen or why W3C was the chosen one. And then another one about um, what are the different hierarchies of different, of different groups working in W3C because I mean, they're mentioning here like the, you can have a task group, you can have a community group or you can have a working group. Um, and, and you mentioned this already before, but maybe if you can give a brief description of each of these groups about what they do or how, to, how you evolve as part of W3C to, to get there. And then I think we covered the main questions for today. All right, I'm gonna um, suggest Manny was our W3C expert uh, on the, I mean, I've been involved for a long, long while, but not nearly as much as he. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I'm sorry, the first question again was, oh, why W3C was chosen? Manu, what's your answer sure. to that? So um, when, when you go to standardize the technology, you have to kind of think about where, um, where the momentum is, right? Or, uh, you know, is this technology we're standardizing built on technologies that have already been built out by that standards group? So in, in the, in the uh, case of decentralized identifiers, um, we were dealing with kind of application layer things, things that are kind of higher up on the technology stack. So uh, let, let me first kind of uh, identify a couple of um, uh, standards body. So there's the International Standards Organization. Um, they deal with um, uh, really high level uh, kind of kind of standards, kind of business process standards. A lot of the financial industry standardizes stuff through ISO. Um, then there's the Internet Engineering Task Force. They deal with super low level standards like bits and bytes that go across internet routers and um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi and, and things of that nature. So they deal with like low, low level internet protocols. The W3C deals with what we call application layer things, things that sit on top of the internet, applications that are kind of built on top of the internet. Web browsers, that's what people kind of think about when it comes to W3C, but they also work on data formats and information models and things of that nature. Uh, and then there's Oasis, and Oasis does a lot of interesting work in things like key management and, again, kind of business processes. Uh, related things um, uh, that are that are a bit higher than than the application stack. Although they, they do quite a bit of application stack stuff as well. In the did spec, uh, in, in with the did spec, um, the IETF was probably too low level, um, meaning that they they you know we were we were talking about you know uh, identifiers that anyone can own and verifiable credentials and all that kind of stuff and we had already started the verifiable credentials work at the World Wide Web Consortium so we already had a chunk of the membership that understood verifiable credentials and understood what it did to do uh, the positive benefits of having DIDs with verifiable credentials so we already had momentum at the W3C um, at ITF um, you know that's kind of application layer stuff that they don't usually touch it's arguable that we might have been able to make it happen uh, but then all of a sudden we would have had you know one set of work at ITF and another set of W3C and sometimes it's difficult to 
to work um, uh, across those two um, uh, organizations, meaning like the people would have been split between the two two organizations just from a time um, uh, basis. ISO takes forever. I'm going to be blunt. It's just a very long, arduous process, and we wanted to get this stuff out to the general um, uh, the general population of the web and the internet as quickly as possible, and ITS and W3C work very quickly. Um, OASIS could have been a fit, but again, I think the thing that kind of moved it towards W3C is we already had a decent bit of momentum there around verifiable credentials and web payments, and decentralized identifiers would benefit both of those things. So, you know, we had more of the membership on board. There are 480 companies. You've got Google, you've got Microsoft, you've got Apple, like all the big tech companies are there, and so we can kind of pull them into the work um, and give that work a boost um, because, the you know, the center of gravity is, is already there. Um, now, there are other bits and pieces that I think we are going to, you know, uh, do at OASIS and do at IETF, um, but for DID specifically, it was just, I think, the, the momentum uh, was, was kind of already there and we could build on top of it. Yeah, and we, we did cover um, community groups that are uh, very lightweight, very easy to start and do not require W3C membership, and then formal working groups that I'm mean, uh, there, there are uh, chartered by W3C. They do require you be a W3C member, uh, which does have a cost associated with it as an individual or, or an organization, and uh, but but can actually do W3C uh, standard, full standards work. Um, the question uh, asked about a third type of group, Manu, uh, a task group. Are you familiar with those? Um, there, there are things like interest groups. Uh, and they're just and business groups, um, and they basically keep an eye on the horizon, right? So um, you, if you if you look at if you think about it as like kind of three horizons or who's looking furthest out, you have interest groups and business groups that are looking ten years out. What's going to happen in the industry? What do we need to put in place? And then the next uh, next group that's kind of looking at the next horizon, like next five years, are community groups, right? They're the ones that are incubating technology, getting them ready. And then the third group are the people that are super focused on, on they have a narrow focus on something that needs to be done now. Those are the working groups, right? They last for two years. They, they're only focused on getting that one thing that they're supposed to get done, done. Um, uh, and so that's that's kind of another way to look at the dif different groups is is how far out on the horizon are they looking? Um, Sounds good. All right. Well, Manu, thank you very much uh, for joining. I know you're uh, in a very busy state with a week left to go to TPAC. Um, uh, and, uh, and meanwhile, IAW, as we said, on the West Coast, to which we invite anyone that uh, it, that is interested enough that wants to come uh, there, that uh, registration remains open, although it may be the first time that IAW sells out. So uh, wow. if you are interested, go check that one out. And uh, Alex, back over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Manu, Dramant. Um, great session. Manu, I hope we will be able to have you in the future to also talk about VRS1. That would be really nice to, to, to show all the other ways about how DIT methods can get implemented and different visions for um, decentralized digital identity. And everyone who's listening to this, um, this has been recorded. We will share it very soon. I mean, I think in the next two hours um, in the blog post we published with the slides and the video. And we will also share it in Telegram group, join the Telegram group and all the different media, uh, social media channels. And um, next subjects we will be talking about is open source and digital identity, about how that works, and some other key um, stuff happening in the SSI space that, that we need to learn about. And again, um, Manu, thank you very much for joining us. Norman, thank you for joining us again. You, it's, I think it's the third, fourth time or third time maybe and that we have you with SSI Meetup. And have a great day and um, very good luck in, in setting up this working group. I really hope it will work out in TPAC. Thank you, Alex. Great. Thanks all. Okay. Bye-bye.